So we have been in the book of Malachi and kind of working our way through that. There are a few things that have jumped out and a few things that we have seen, a few messages that have been repeated and have been coming up over and over and over again. As we've been in, in Malachi, we've been reminded and maybe over and above anything else, what we have seen and what we have heard is that God is calling his people. He is calling you back into relationship with him. God loves his people. God loves you, and he has proven that love by keeping his promises. He has given himself and everything that he has to you. But he's also, as we've heard, he's also been left wondering at times about our commitment to him. And all of this really, it kind of revolves around a promise. It revolves around an original promise that took place and started way back in the book of Genesis, way back with Abraham, and then it was renewed and it was repeated. It was reiterated again with, with Isaac and then with, with Isaac's son Jacob and even, even Isaac's other son Esau has been a part of this on some level also. Way back, way back in Genesis chapter 12, God called Abraham to faith. God looked at Abraham, a man who, who did not know him, a man who was not an Israelite because Israel really did not exist at that time yet, but called this man Abraham out of his family, out of his nation, out of his home, out of everything that he knew to give him in many ways a new identity, an identity that revolved around his willingness, Abraham's willingness to follow and to believe and to give up everything in his past and say, no, now this is who I am. This is who I am. This is what defines me. Now I am a follower, a believer, and a worshiper of God. And God said, if you do this, if you follow me, I am going to bless you. I'm going to make you the father of an entire nation. And mind you that Abraham at this time, Abraham and his wife Sarah, they were, they were about 90 years old. They were, they were well past childbearing age. They had no kids of their own. And God said, look, I'm gonna make you a nation. I'm gonna turn you into a nation. Your descendants are gonna be as numerous as the stars. And then Isaac was born because God made a promise to Abraham. And Isaac was born as part of that covenant, part of that promise. And then to Isaac later on, another generation later, Isaac himself then had, had, a, had a couple of twins, had, had twins, twin sons, Jacob and Esau, that who themselves were eventually came to represent those who, who follow God in Jacob and those, and those who do not in Esau. And at the heart of that promise, can really be summed up and really be summarized and say that what, what that promise entailed, that original promise to Abraham entailed, it entailed God saying, look, I will be your God. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will bless you. I will provide salvation to the world through you and you will obey me and you will be my witnesses. That was the promise. That was the agreement that was made. You see, the reality is that you cannot, you cannot half obey or half witness to God. Either, either you're all in or, or you're all out. There's no in between. There's no half this and half that. I will be your God and you will be my people. We're going to take a look at uh, Malachi chapter 3 this morning, or a section of Malachi chapter 3 this morning. Before we dig too far into our, our text, let me go ahead and let's pray for God to bless our time in his word this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to your word, Lord, we come to you in prayer before that once again, Lord. Lord, we come asking that you open our ears and our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we may hear, that we may see, that we may understand, that we may be transformed and changed and moved and fall deeper in love with you because of what we read here this morning, Lord because of your word to us. Speak to us this morning, Lord. In your name, let me, me chapter 
chapter 3, and it starts off much um, like what we've seen. It seems like every time we start this, it always starts off with God making some sort of um, grand declaration and pronouncement about him and about his view of his people and about his relationship with us and that. And that just kind of kicks off and sets the tone for everything else that comes. We get the same thing. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 is where we're going to start reading this morning. Here is what God says. Here's what he's saying to his people Israel. Here's what he's saying to us this morning. Hear these words. He says, I, the Lord, do not change so that you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. For ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how do we return or how are we to return? There's a lot of comfort in those opening words, right? There's a lot of comfort that comes when, when God says and when he starts off by saying, I, the Lord, do not change. There's a tremendous amount of comfort that comes in the knowledge and the guarantee that God doesn't change. Actually, in Hebrews, um, New Testament, we're going to go to Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, um, chapter 13, at one point, the, the author of Hebrews, he's talking, he's, telling, he's talking to his readers, to us. He's saying, he's talking about the, the reality of suffering, and the reality of persecution, and the reality that the world that we live in is broken and messed up and we so often find ourselves on the receiving end of that and then as a solution to that the author of Hebrews says the solution to that is to remember that Jesus is the same yesterday today and tomorrow forevermore the solution to the chaos and the brokenness is the fact that God doesn't change think about our world think about our world we're tired we're wiped out we're exhausted the, this Global pandemic is still happening. It's, it's been a year. You realize that? It's been a year since reports first started coming out that this stuff was happening. Numbers are still going up. We're still trying to figure out, in some cases, economic stuff. We're still trying to figure out political stuff. The, the, world, the world is chaotic, and yet, through it all, God does not change. In Malachi, in Malachi, we read that you know, when God says, look, I, I don't change, and I don't change so that you are not destroyed. I do not change. I remain the same so that you can live, so that you won't die. See, forgiveness, salvation, eternal life, all this stuff, the gospel, all this stuff that draws us to God in the first place, all this stuff, this is, um, this is all based on God's faithfulness to you. It's not, it's not based on our faithfulness to God. And that's something that I think far too often we get, we get too caught up into and we get, we get too stuck in the thinking. See, our salvation, our forgiveness, it's all based on God's faithfulness to you, not your faithfulness to God. And that cuts out the guessing game. It cuts out the guessing game because there's no need then when, when, when our salvation, when our forgiveness is based on God's faithfulness to us, it, there's no need then to wonder if you're good enough to be saved. The reality, as we see over and over and over again in Scripture, is that we're not. We're not good enough to be saved. That's a good thing our salvation is not based on our faithfulness because we would mess it up every single minute. But yet, it's based on God's faithfulness to us. And so we don't have to wonder. Believers can always be confident in knowing that their salvation is absolutely secure. It's not going anywhere because our God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And then he says, there in verse 7, he says, return to me and I will return to you. Just to be clear, this is not a conditional statement. God's not saying, if you return to me, then I will return to you. There's no if in there. It's simply a statement of return to me and I will return to you. This is, this is a, a, an invitation to you, to us, to renew your relationship with God. When God says then, return to me, 
I think it's probably pretty natural to do and to say exactly what, what the Israelites kind of respond. It's very natural then to ask, okay, we hear that and we want to. God, I want to come back to you, but how? How do I do that? How do we do that? Verse 8. Verse 8. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. This is kind of a weird response from God, right? He's, you know, he's saying, come on, come back to me and return to me. And people say, well, I want to return to you. I want to be good with you. So how do we do that? Now, what does God do? He goes into talking about robbing him. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet, yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? Which again, that's a good question to ask. If somebody says, if God accuses us of robbing him, we want to know, okay, how are, we, how are we robbing you, God? Tell us, how are we robbing you? I don't want to rob you. Tell me how we're robbing you. How are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. And that is, that is a very serious accusation. Um, you know, the accusation that, you know, what we saw a couple of weeks ago of half-hearted worship, that's, that's one of those accusations. I don't, I don't like hearing that. I don't like it when God says, you know, I'm, I'm questioning your love for me because you're only kind of half-worshiping me. Um, last week's accusation, I'm questioning whether or not you love me because you, you, are, you are complicit in the various forms of injustice that exist and that, that are taking place in our world. And now, I don't know, but for me, this, this accusation that I am robbing God, that's the one that I think for me personally really hits me the hardest. I'm like, I, I, I'm stealing. God is saying, look, you are, you are stealing from me. You are actually stealing from me. And he gets into this stuff about tithe. That's kind of where our minds first want to go. And he's talking about tithes and, 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 and a tithe, you know, when you think about a tithe, that's this um, um, generally understood and generally defined as, as giving 10% of your income to, um, to God, to the church, or, or whatever it might be. Um, that being the tithe. The tithe, it's worth, pointing, it's worth kind of taking a moment to step back and remember where did and how did the tithe begin. And the tithe began, a biblical tithe that began, it was established in Deuteronomy chapter 14. If you want to leave your finger at Malachi and flip over to Deuteronomy 14 a second and take a little closer look to what, how this started and where this started from. In Deuteronomy 14, this is where we get the first command from God to tithe, to his people, to tithe, to give. There's some examples of it happening before that. This is the first time it's actually sort of put in stone, so to speak, where it's actually sort of made biblical law. In Deuteronomy 14, he says, 14 verse 22, God says, be sure to set aside a tenth of all your field's produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, um, new wine and olive oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place he will choose as a dwelling for his name so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. So in, in biblical law, the tithe was you bring a tenth, of, a tenth of your yearly profit to the temple for God. But it's verse 23 that I think is a piece that we miss a lot of times here in, in Deuteronomy 14, verse 23. At the very end of the verse, he says, Look, bring all this stuff so that, this is a purpose statement, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. God is saying, look, bring stuff to me, bring me your tithe as a means of learning how to revere me, learning how to believe in me, learning how to worship me so that you come and you can learn more about who I am and what I do. There's quite a bit of debate. This is kind of one of these kind of debatable things in our faith that, you know, some people say, yeah, well, you know, this is Old Testament stuff, and as Christians, you know, we're not, Christians aren't required to tithe anymore, and that's, that's just sort of a thing. We don't have to worry about that, and regardless of whether or not Christians may or may not be held to this standard or this command of tithing, there is still this underlying principle of learning and showing reverence toward God that is still at play and still at work. The Bible, the Bible is clear. Give back to God, not, not in order to fund the church and to pay the church bills, not in order to pay me my salary so that I continue to get a paycheck. Don't give to do all of that stuff or to keep all of that stuff going. Do it to show reverence to God. Give 
to show reverence to God. It's interesting because Old Testament, New Testament, tithing, tithing in quotes, all the New Testament commands to give and examples of giving by God's people are often used to provide various forms of kind of social services. Deuteronomy 14 again, verse 28. Go down to verse 28 in Deuteronomy 14. At the end of every three years, bring all the tithes of that year's produce and store it in your own town so that the Levites, who have no allotment or inheritance of their own, and the foreigners, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns may come and eat and be satisfied, and so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. God's people give as a form of biblical justice, as we talked about last week. It's not, it's also, you look at Deuteronomy 14 here, it's not limited just to money either. It's not limited just to finance. It's not saying don't bring just, just the money that you made. And he gives a list there in, in verse 22. Um, he says, look, bring, bring your grain, bring your wine, bring your olive oil, bring your animals, your herds, your flocks, bring all of this stuff that you have Bring it here and give it to me. See, God considers hoarding or withholding things from him to be a form of robbing him, of stealing from him. So what do we do? What do we do then? Back over to Malachi. Malachi. Back over to Malachi chapter 3. There are actually two commands that God gives us here through Malachi in, in this text today. Two commands that I think we need, to, we need to hear. We need to hear and we need to pay attention to. Malachi chapter 3, back to chapter 3. Take a look at verse 10. It says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines of your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Two commands, two commands that come up here. They're both in verse 10 and then verse 11 kind of elaborates on some of this stuff. But the first command that we're given here in terms of what do we do about this now, he says right at the beginning of verse 10, he says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Bring the whole tithe. Don't So kind of like worship from a couple weeks ago, if we only bring a fraction of what God is asking of us, then we are only half faithful. We're only half worshiping. We're only half committed. Think about this. How satisfied would any of you be, how satisfied would anybody be if your spouse or your best friend or somebody that you really cared about and somebody that you really valued said, you know, I... I, 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 I kind of love you. I, I kind of like you. Ki- kind of. I, not, not wholly. I, I, just, I just kind of love you. What would, what would our response be? Because see, no one is going to accept, we're not going to accept half love as love. Either, either you love me or you don't. Either, either you're all in on this relationship or you're not really in it at all. There's not a whole lot of in-between when it comes to relationships. There's not a whole lot of in-between when it comes to our relationship with God. And God's saying here, he's saying, look, don't, don't insult me by, by bringing me, by bringing me only kind of half worship or don't insult me with half reverence. Give me everything. Give me everything. Give me the whole thing. A year ago, and it was a year ago now, I, had, I actually had to go back to my files and look this up. A year ago, we did a, a sermon series on the seven churches in Revelation. Um, you, you remember when we did that? That was actually kind of one of my favorite sermon series I've ever done. One of those churches, the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, um, was described as an accused of being lukewarm, and God rebuked them, and he called them to repentance and to wholeheartedness. He said, you can't be, you're, either, you're either hot or cold. You can't be, you can't be both. Either you're in or you're out. You can't be both. He's saying kind of the same thing here. He's saying, look, bring the whole tithe. Don't don't hold back from giving God everything that he is asking for from you. 
because he would then consider that to be robbing him and stealing. Give him the full measure of what he has given you to give to him. Give him the full measure. Give him everything. So that's the first, that's the first command. Bring the whole tithe. Second command, about halfway through verse 10, he says, and this one might be a little bit shocking to, to some of us, depending on what you've heard over the course of your life. He says, test me in this. Now, a lot of you have probably grown up, and you've probably been told over and over and over again in your life, you know, you should, don't, don't, put the, don't put God to the test. You should not test God. That's a sin. And yet, if you were to go through and start reading through the Bible, you actually might be quite amazed and surprised at how often God actually doesn't just invite, he actually commands his people to test him. He actually gives you a command to test him and see what he's going to do. If you don't believe him, he says, test me, test me in this and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Giving and generosity reveal, have a tendency to reveal the true nature of our faith and our trust in God. Israel, Israel was commanded to tithe as we saw in Deuteronomy 14, in order to learn how to revere God, he were commanded to tithe in order to learn how to trust God and worship him more fully. Malachi now calls us and says, give the whole tithe and test God. Give the whole tithe and use that maybe as a test of your faith. It says God, God's saying, he's saying, Test me, test me, and I will show you my faithfulness. Test me and see what I will do. Test me and give me everything that you have, and I will give you even more. Test me, because I've made a promise to you that I would do certain things. Test me, and I will prove to you that I will be made, that I will be good on my promises. Test me. Now, Caveat, very important caveat when you're looking at this. God is not saying, he is not saying that he is going to make you rich. I'm gonna be very clear and very upfront about that. God is not saying that if you give, that he's gonna give you more money and that he's going to give you more stuff and more material. Okay, so you can't go and give, you know, give your paycheck this month to the church and then expect that God's gonna turn around and give you a brand new boat. All right, that's, that's not going to happen. That's not what God promises and that's not how this stuff works. What he does promise here, what he does promise, he says, test me. And see that I will not, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, blessing on you. God promises blessing. He, he's going to see your heart. He's going to see your level of faith and your, your level of willingness to trust him for things in life and for things in your life. And he, is, he's, he, he will bless you. Because of that, he will bless you so much that it will be impossible to contain that blessing. In fact, he's going to bless you so much, you're going to run out of room. If you could even stick his blessing in a box or stick it in a room or build a barn and fill it up or whatever, it's going to fill up the barn and it's going to overflow and it's going to spill out the walls and the windows and the doors and, and it's going to come out the loft and it's going to be spreading all over your field and all over the neighborhood and your neighbors are going to get irritated because you have so much blessing, you can't contain it. You won't have enough room to store all the blessing that God is going to give you because you trust him enough to take care of you and you trust him enough to give everything that he asks of you. In verse 12, verse 12, what comes out of this? Aside from blessing, but all that blessing is a pretty good thing to come out of it anyways. But what comes out of it then? Verse 12. Then, when I've blessed you and all this stuff is going like this because you're willing to bring me, because you're willing to be wholehearted and wholly worship me, then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. 
God wants the world to see what he is capable of. He wants to use you to do that. Typically, typically we'll, we'll look around our neighbors, we'll look around our neighbors and we'll, and we'll wish, you know, we'll wish, we'll say, man, I wish I had a house like them, or I wish I had, I had a car like them, or I wish I had a yard that looks like theirs. I think, you know, my, my in-laws, I'm pretty sure that's what everybody on their street thinks about my father-in-law's yard, um, because he just, he obsesses over it, and that's just kind of what happens. But typically, okay, we'll look at, we'll look at our neighbors and say, I wish I had a house like theirs, or a car like theirs, or I wish I could go on vacations like they go on, or I wish I had a yard that looked like theirs. I wish, I wish, I wish, and we want, and we want, and we want, and God is saying, look, I'm going to bless you. If you come with me, if you bring me your all, if you, if you come holy to me, I'm going to bless you and your neighbors are going to see just how blessed you are. There's no mention here, and this might rub some of us the wrong way, there's no mention here of our neighbors seeing how blessed we are and then coming to faith because of what they see and because they want what we have. That's just, that's not where God, that's not where Malachi is putting the focus and the emphasis on here at this point. The emphasis here is on your relationship with God. Your relationship, not theirs. God is calling you to be most concerned with the status of your heart and your faith right now. Not theirs. Your neighbors. Your neighbors will come if God, if God is calling them to himself. And they might come through you because they see how God is blessing you. They might come from some, through some other means or through somebody else. But right now, this is about you and God. Are you giving him the whole tithe? Are you giving him everything that he is asking from you? Theme through Malachi has very much been God loves you. He loves you. He, he loves his people and he's in it. He's all in, but, but he's, he's angry in many ways. He's angry because he's, he's, not, he's not sure that we're as in love with him as he is with us. But he loves his people and he is faithful to his people and, and he is willing to do something to ensure that his people, that you remain his people and his children. And his commands, his commands, the commands that we've seen here, his commands are not simply for the sake of creating legalism and, and making life hard for us or difficult or challenging or, or to beat us up and to push us down and to make us feel like we're, we're no good. It's not, it has nothing to do with that. The commands that he's giving us in Malachi and throughout his word, these all revolve around that single call to come, come and receive, come and experience my grace, my love for you. Come and be blessed. Come and know just how much I love you. Come, test me and see how much I love you.